This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. For our first show of 2019, cinematographer Adrian Peng Correa joined us in the studio. Adrian found his joy of cinema in college after leaving an engineering program to pursue history and sociology. Encouraged by a mentor at school, he immersed himself in film, devouring as many books on the subject as he could and renting hundreds of foreign movies at the campus video store. In one film, Visions of Light, a Bible to many aspiring cinematographers, he watched it over and over, cementing his goal to become a DP. With few contacts in the business, Adrian's determination lifted him up from humble roots working as an entry-level PA in the New York film industry to becoming a leading director of photography for television networks and feature films. Adrian, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, You know, when I first heard about you, I said, oh, you sound interesting and like you've done a lot of stuff and you're actually the first DP we've had on, so thanks for that too. Thank Uh, you. Um part of that uh, honor, I guess. Um, and uh, But then when I read your, your bio, I was stunned at how inspiring it was, really. Um, Thanks. I mean, you know, you know, you're somebody who knew what they wanted to do from, you know, a pretty early age in college, even though you were in college doing engineering, and you said that wasn't for you, right? <laughs> oh, no. But tell us a little bit about, about the, your early roots and how you, how you found your passion. Well, I was always a film nerd. Um, my father, that's, my father was a, not a very loquacious person, so we would just kind of like connect with films, and he watched everything from like classic westerns to really bad sci-fi. My mother was a huge horror junkie. Like I watched Gates of Hell, Lucio Fulci's movie when I was like eight years old, like <laughs> really inappropriate stuff for a kid to be watching. And um, You do remember it. Though. Oh, I remember. I remember. There's this. I, uh, yeah. This, <laughs> I remember everything about that movie, actually. Um, but so I was always into film. Huge. And then um, and from classics to genre pictures to everything. And then I kept watching it in school because I wasn't a big I wasn't a big party guy. You know, it's like and it was just something where I was like, I just kept watching movies. It was just something I liked to do. And I had done a little bit of still photography and. I remember I'd, I was an engineer at University of Connecticut because my father told me to be an engineer. And I was like, great, I'll do that. And uh, it was a third year of college, and I still didn't know what an engineer did. And uh, <laughs> all I did was study and fail. That might be a red flag right there. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember Professor Ramesh Mala, I'm not going to do his, his voice because it would be terrible, but he, I remember him telling me that I think you should take civil engineering again. And literally, as soon as he finished <laughs> that sentence, I was like, we're done. <laughs> and um, and I was just, I went into history and sociology because history was always a huge subject of mine. My father was a, a big war nut. So we, you know, we bonded over a lot of history. And then, so I just started, it gave me the freedom in, uh, to be able to look for some other kind of electives. And I found, there was this professor named Bob Smith at the University of Connecticut who did this uh, film school, film course. And it was like film 101 or whatever, you know. But it delved heavily into the history of film, not in terms of uh, uh, practicalities, but it was all theory and, and, and artistic ideals of what a film is trying to communicate. And I really got into the nuts and bolts of it. It was kind of like breaking something, reverse engineering how something played to you. And I was, it was just fascinating. And I had more electives. What else was I going to take? I kept taking Bob's courses. And then he would recommend books, and I'd read books. And then my history professor, Robert Asher, we would never talk about history. We would drink wine and talk about movies. And he would talk to me about foreign directors that I never heard of, like uh, Louis Manuel and Kurosawa and uh, Tarkovsky and Truffaut and Ozu. And um, there was this great video store at the University of Connecticut called Video Visions when we still had brick-and-mortar stores. And they had everything. So literally everything Professor Asher had told all me those to watch, films that, that I would just go yeah. and rent those movies. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, and that's all I did was uh, watch those movies. And then it just kept seeping its way into me. And then I took some higher level film courses with Bob Smith and that got deeper into it and it became even more fascinating to me. And then I was looking around Video Visions and there was this documentary called Visions of Light and it was about the history of cinematography. And I didn't, w- still in the weeds a little bit in terms of all the, the, the branches of of, uh, of uh, like uh, skill sets that make up what filmmakers do. Yeah. 
but Visions of Light was top 10 on Roger Ebert's list that year. I remember seeing, uh, it was, I think it was number eight or something like that. And I was like, oh, what is this doc? Found it at Video Visions. I was like, oh, I should rent this. And then I watched it and it was like a light bulb going off. I remember exactly as, as thinking through that picture, like, this is what a cinematographer does. This is what cinematography, this is amazing. And then I just, I, I bought a book called Masters of Light, which was technically way over my head, but it was just fascinating to read. And I remember I read that book three times in a row. <laughs> and then I just kept delving deeper into it. I picked up my still camera again, started shooting again, and it just really kind of to, to kind of eat at me. And then I graduated from the University of Connecticut at 23. And my mother was sick with cancer. And uh, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew she didn't have much time. So I, I kind of put grad grad school on hold. I was going to go get my doctorate in history at the University of Maryland. And I just waited. And I was just like, I'm, i got to stay with my mom and make sure, just be here for her as best I can. Yeah. And uh, And when she passed away, she was very young. She was only 53. Yeah. And I remember I was 20... I think it was like 24 at the time, 23. And I was like, my life, if I die when my mom dies, my life's half over. Hmm. And I was just like, what do I want to do? No. And then cinematography was just like, it was the only thing in my life that was like pulling at me. Like everything else, you know, happens, you know, you got to pay bills, you got to whatever. But cinematography was literally like really pulling at me. And I had a friend, Michael Field, who's a writer-director, and he was like, you should be a filmmaker. You should go do this course with me. So we took this short film course in New York for two months, and I was like, this is, I kind of know all this stuff. Mm. And I was like, I should. You had done a ton of reading yeah. up until this yeah. point, right? I didn't have a lot of practical experience by any means, but but I, I kind of knew all these things. I felt like I was kind of wasting money. And then um, <clears throat> I was like, I'm going to go to a grad school course. So I applied to the Vancouver Film School, and then I did the math. And I'm, we come from like middle class, lower middle class background. You can't really make a mistake when you come from that kind of background. It's like if you, you want to do something, it better pay off. And I looked at the numbers of what it would cost, $20,000 to go for there for a year. Vancouver is one of the most expensive cities in the world to live. That was going to be, I estimated, probably another ten grand. Hmm. So thirty grand coming out in debt, like what would that do to me and my chances to try and get in, in the, yeah. the film industry? Yeah. And I was just like, I don't think I can handle that burden. I was an RA in college to defer costs and everything, kind of keep all my costs as low as possible. I didn't have any debt coming out of college. Hmm. And I was like, $30,000 would probably limit my, my chances, quite frankly, if I had a slow period or something like that. And little did I know, uh, it ended up being a, a smart decision because the film industry in the beginning is a lot about managing the slow times. Um, so... I was going to go, but I was still going to think about it. And I talked to a, a DP named Dave Klein, who was a uh, Kevin Smith's director of photography who shot clerks. And he had gone to Vancouver film school and he was like, don't go. He's hmm. like, just go start working. Hmm. So I was like, I had a few contacts at, uh, at New York film Academy, namely this guy named Salvador Bolivar. And he had kind of shepherded me a little bit, mainly because he thought I was Dominican. Um, <laughs> the first job he hired on me on, <laughs> I got to set and literally everybody's speaking Spanish and I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> I remember Sal turning his head to me, look at me. He's like, you're not Dominican. And I'm like, no. He's like, you can stay anyway. And then I, I was his, his AC for a while. Try to learn, keep, try to brush up on my Spanish. I'd never got any better. And then, um, you didn't pick any up on and, set, huh? Uh, it, 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 films that's not the place to pick up language <laughs> not that I'm a, a polyglot or anything but it was just it was not you know so I learned from Sal and and, and I worked for a few years and then uh, you know I, I started to work my way up and Salvador was shooting this really bad movie it was a tough movie but it was on 35 and he asked me to first AC and I did it and I first AC'd on this movie and I remember at the end of that job I was like, I'm not good enough. And I don't think I'm going to get good enough to succeed. What, what, why didn't you think you were good enough? Well, back then, uh, when I started in the late, late 90s, it, you still had to follow a path as a cinematographer. You were a loader, and you were a second AC, then you were a first AC, and then you were an operator, and then you became a DP in some capacity. And that's pretty much what I knew. Like, that's 
how it's going to happen. And I had loaded, I could do that. Um, second, I could do that. Uh, first, I started doing it. And I knew that was the longest road between first and operating. And I was doing it and I was like, it's an incredibly detail oriented job. It's incredibly specific in terms of hand eye coordination. And I was, that's not me. And at the end of it, I was like that job. I was like, I'm not good enough. And I don't think I'm ever going to get that good enough to be able to succeed at a high enough level that I'm going to be able to make these yeah. jumps and then progress. So I was like, what else can I do? And then I had a friend who was in grip electric and he was like, well, you know, where, where you really learn to light is grip electric, you know? And I was like, okay. So I started grip electric work to, uh, kind of learn how to cut light, how to shape light, what lights did. And that really was when I started to develop a skill set that I still hold on to pretty, pretty tightly. I'm, I pretty much know what I want to do from a lighting perspective. It's not a mystery. I don't, I don't turn to my gaffer and be like, let's make it look like morning. I'll be like, <laughs> let's put this out here. Let's right. do this. And then we'll discuss specifics of lamps and whatnot. But I kind of know what I want to do and how to do it. You know, from where, you know where you want to flag and you know yeah. where. Exactly. You know, I know where, how I want to so cut it. I know yeah. the, the style and the, the, the quality of cuts I want. I'm, I'm pretty specific about that. I actually give more freedom to my camera operators than I do my, my, my gaffers or my key grips because yeah. I'm, I'm pretty specific with lighting. But I'll take stories and I mean, I'll take like I'll let I'll let operators kind of build out um, what they think can work. And if it works for what I think the progression of the scene should be, I'll. I'll do it. If not, um, I'll change. But that's, I started to do that. And also because grip electric work was more plentiful in New York. I'm like, so I can work more and hopefully be able to. How long to did weather. you do that? Uh, well, I'd probably say like steadily for like five, six years. Hmm. And when it, things were terrible, hmm. I would do other jobs. I substitute taught in the state of Connecticut for a while. I worked at brick and mortar video stores for a good long time. I, uh, I worked at McDonald's. I mean, I kind of did everything. Video stores is a career track for filmmakers. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, I definitely embraced that whole Quentin Tarantino did it yep. and I right, didn't exactly. do it too. But <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like almost famous where it's like you become a rock critic so you can get uh, free records from the record company. It was the same <laughs> thing, like work at a video store so you can get movies. And, um, and I just, it, it helped and I kept watching movies to build my, my repertoire essentially. So, you know, it was educational as much as it was practical, but you know, like when you don't have any connections from film school, because I didn't go really, like you have a very limited pool of people to pull uh, resources from in terms of like, hey, can you get me a job? Can you, you know, and, and I'm not really good at that hustle anyway, being like calling someone up and say, hey, do you got work for me? Um, so I knew that I was going to have to find some way to kind of sustain myself while I built the contacts in the career. Mm. And that took a good long time. You know, it took a, it took a, uh, quite a bit of time, frankly. And then I just tried to find some other ways to to get myself on the faster track of being a DP. And then luckily, um, the because when I started, it was mostly film. And you know how expensive it is to shoot film. The tools aren't very accessible. Not many people owned film cameras. And then the mini DV revolution happened. And basically, there was a, mag a magazine called Res Mag, hmm. like R-E-S, like resolution, I'm assuming. Hmm. I can't remember exactly what the what it was short for, but... And that was all about mini DV filmmaking. And at that time, the celebration was coming, and uh, Lars von Trier and that whole thing with the uh, Dancer in the Dark, all these like small cameras. I worked on Peter Hedges' film, Pieces of April, which was shot for Indigent on the, uh, the Sony DVX 1000 cameras with the anamorphic adapter. Oh, gosh. Like, yeah. And that was a movie that was shot for like nothing. I think we did like $150,000 in the can or $300,000 in the can, something ridiculously small. But that made it tangible. I was like, oh, I can buy this camera. And I remember the camera, too. It was a JVC GY DV500. <laughs> doesn't matter if you guys know it because it doesn't exist <laughs> anymore. And I bought that, and I was like, I'm going to be – now I can I can be part of the revolution, and I can start shooting stuff, and I have a camera, so that gives me a leg up in terms of creating content. And then um, it was something where I didn't understand the importance of a reel. And yeah. that's when I uh, – I started to build out my reel in a kind of very calculated, cynical way, which is uh, I had a friend who told me, if it's not on your reel, most people aren't going to believe you can do it. You know, because if you're a producer or a director and you have a period piece, 
set in the Midwest in the 1920s. If you don't have some kind of period work, some kind of days ahead they're not gonna, right? They're not. They're gonna, like, mm, you like, can't do that. You're right. trying to minimize risk as a producer right. or director. I mean, obviously, you want artistic, uh, artistically viable and, and exciting, dynamic people, but there's also the, the great element of risk. And if you don't have it on your reel, you know, it's very difficult for a lot of people to believe that yeah. that you can do it. So very cynically, I started to think about what reels had. You know, they have day exterior stuff, which most people can go out and do, just shoot at the right time of day, so, sort of thing making women look great because that is without question something that is a huge deal for people day interiors where you're actually lighting something night exteriors all these things that like i thought about the holes in my reel Mm. and then i took whatever money i had like whatever money i had and whatever resources i had in terms of people and then i started to just build these shots literally like not scenes shots shots i'd be like i'll give them most beautiful they basically look. storyboarded a reel I storyboarded my reel yeah. so basically I was like where's the most beautiful woman actor I know okay let's sit here and just shoot a beautiful close up of her great uh, let's oh let's go down to the train station because they have tons of available lamps there and I can get a few small lights and I can create a night exterior out of nothing put that on the reel uh, my dad was a huge army nut so he had a bunch of like old army stuff like, oh, really? like an old M1 rifle and a <laughs> backpack and the steel helmet put my friend Terry in all that stuff, you know, and started throwing dirt at him as he ran through the, <laughs> the, 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 and I built some period war stuff, you know, and then like, I just kept building this stuff into the reel. And then suddenly I had a two minute reel. I got to see this reel. I don't even know if I have oh, it anymore. No. I went down to the dock in Milford, Connecticut. Yeah. And I shot a, a, a magic hour dusk scene on this dock for one shot. And I'm like, oh, I just keep building all these, stealing these little things to fill out the reel. And then I got a few student productions from SUNY. I did a couple things from Yale. And then the reel just kind of started, started to take to shape. Evolve, yeah. And yeah. then I really concentrated on my interviewing skills. And it was kind of like I just kind of tried to build myself. One of my mentors is a guy named Tom Stern who's Clint Eastwood cinematographer. And I remember I was at a dinner. And he turned to a friend and he said, Adrian's built this cinematography. And this is when I still hadn't done anything. And he was like, Adrian's built this cinematography career out of nothing, (laughs) like literally nothing. And I was sat there and I was like, huh. But then after, because I felt kind of bad, I was like, I'm not nothing. (laughs) But then I remember afterwards, I'm like, well, I guess it is kind of a compliment because I literally did have nothing. And I just kind of just created an idea of myself as a cinematographer through these small vignettes that I could build with my camera. Well, how did, how did, um, Getting back to Visions of Light, because, you know, it was a, it's been a big influence on a lot of us. Mm. Um, you know, just getting, having a nice capsule documentary about all these greats like, you know, Greg Tolan and Nestor Elamendros and everybody, because Laszlo Kovacs. Um, wh- who do you think, who, could you pick out one or more influences on you and their style from seeing that, because you saw it at such an impressionable age? Well, I always loved the <coughs> idea... John Alton was a cinematographer who did really amazing stuff on these super low-budget B-movies. And um, obviously, he also shot American in Paris, some other huge movies. But like his, where, where he's kind of known for is like his film noir cinematography on movies like T-Men and The Big Combo. Joseph H. Lewis is a magnificent director also. He was an influence because he did amazing movies for very little money, like Gun, Cra- Gun Crazy and, and, and Big Combo. And, um, and you know... Uh, Alan Davieu in the documentary talks about the fact that John Alton wasn't just like just a cinematographer. He wrote a book called Painting with Light. And like, Mm -hmm. and back then the style of it, of cinematography, like all those things were very close knit secrets for a lot of cameramen, you know, like it was film industry was not an open thing, you know, like it was basically through nepotism and a very closed circuit number of people. I mean, I'm still amazed at James Wong Howe was able to be a cinematographer just considering the racial aspect back then. But anyway, uh, that's a diversion. James Wong Howe is another amazing cinematographer that who's an influence. But for Alton, you know, like he, Painting with Light, I was able to get that book and it teaches you just the basics of photography. You know, like how to create depth and, and color and shadow and using highlights to kind of separate elements. And I, that was definitely the first thing off of Visions of Light that I was like, Here's a textbook. Here's a textbook. Hmm. 
And that was definitely the foundation for my mm -hmm. style cinematography was in the beginning. And then I kind of used John's blueprint and then trying to extrapolate it off those other influences that I, st I started to become more in tune with from a cinematography standpoint, because like, you know, I get a lot of my, um, kind of like this heightened naturalism thing and my stylization from someone like Stanley Cortez who did, you know, incredible work in like the Magnificent Ambersons and H Night of the Hunter, but then also did like really great B movie work in like Shock Corridor for Samuel Fuller. And, um, and I loved Russell Meddy's kind of expressive technicolor work with, uh, with um, Douglas Sirk in movies like Written on the Wind and All the Heaven Allows. And then there's this great naturalism thing with, with Conrad Hall um, with like Butch and Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and, and, and Cold Blood. And, you know, like when Conrad Hall said like, you know, like they were like, come, one of Conrad Hall's tenets was the fact that you can't fight the sun. You know, so you might as well embrace what it had, what it's going to give you. And that's kind of freeing at a certain point because a lot of times when you're shooting cinematography, you're shooting stuff outside, you know, like you have to know how to use the sun to be your friend, so to speak. And, you know, like once I really started to understand that, I started to understand how to use the sun to, to give me things to benefit my cinematography as as opposed to something I had to fight against. And then, uh, and then you know, with Gordon Willis, you know, like you can just everything about the revolutionary nature of the way he viewed photography kind of kind of plays itself across in, 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 in the history of cinema from obviously, you know, Godfather is a massive touchstone. But, you know, even something as simple as like if you know the history of it, like his work with on uh, all, um, all the President's Men, you know, like actually like having the set wired with fluorescence, you know, where all the electrics are laughing at him in, in, uh, in Los Angeles and saying he's a New York hack. And, you know, like, and the funny thing is we do that nowadays with fluorescence all the time to kind of create the sense of naturalism. But for back then, you know, he was really fighting against, you know, decades of filming and lighting experience from the uh, the film, the basically the Hollywood institution. And, like, for him to have the, the, the foresight to say this is the way to do something mm -hmm. and then, like, that kind of – I sometimes I wish I would embrace a little bit more of that type of uh, – kind of like stick to in terms of artistry because I'm, I'm a really a, a big time collaborator and when I think about having to fight things I often don't fight and I, I when I think about the things that I want to influence me it's that kind of hard boiled and kind of tough guy artistry of, of Gordon Wallace that I kind of really hmm. admire. Well you came you came along uh, right at the uh, transition <coughs> from film stocks to digital yeah, basically. So you have that you have that film knowledge, and you have the the digital. I mean, are you shooting film at all now? Last time I shot film was two thousand and ten. Hmm. That's the last time I shot. I shot a thirty five millimeter feature in Connecticut here, actually, and um, and I kind of really went for it. We pushed two stops. Like it was, we went pretty bold with the look of it. I still love it. I still miss it, but um. I'm actually in the market to try and find, um, to buy a 35 millimeter camera or super 16 camera right now to get back into it, frankly. Huh. Uh, and it goes back to a little thing we talked about off, off, off cast, so to speak about the, 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 um, the stakes of what it means to roll. I like the discipline of film. I mean, I d obviously the artistic expression of it is amazing, but you know, it's, I like the discipline of film and obviously the look of it is, something inherently wonderful but um there's something about the alchemy that comes with it not just in the photochemical processes but in terms of actual production shooting with film and the way it affects the filmmaking process on set i find kind of fascinating so well i mean do you think um because you were we'll maybe talk about that a little bit but do you think there's maybe uh i don't know uh, a, a sort of a lack of discipline in the sense that well you can roll you can keep rolling and rolling and rolling now and yeah. you're not looking at any kind of major cost yeah uh, except for hard drives you know so. yeah I mean we just I I understand the art how a director would like to keep rolling a lot of art directors like doing it because they don't like the the what having resets do in terms of like breaking the actors breaking the spell of it and a lot of directors I know like like the fact that we're still rolling actually it kind of forces a sort of discipline but to me it kind of is like uh pushing a snowball uphill 
you know, at a certain point, like that stuff gets really tenuous. And then the vibe on set, when you do these continued roles, always gets loose. And uh, digital allows you to, to do that. It allows you to not miss a moment, so to speak, you know, but uh, sometimes I, I wonder what the tra the value is in the trade off in terms of between, between if we had a little bit more discipline, would you get a better take? And a lot of oftentimes I would say that you do with discipline. Um, but I also can't argue with the fact that there's been a couple of times on set where, you know, rolling has gotten a few nuggets, but you know, that we maybe not would have gotten, but, right. but that also means I also have to think about money. I mean, I'm a cinematographer, sure. But at the end of the day, I have to answer for how much we roll. And when a producer comes to me and says, Hey, we're, you know, we're $10,000 over on hard drives already, <laughs> you know, like that's, um, still is a cost. Yeah. yeah. And cinematography, I mean, that's the thing about being a cinematographer, you know, photography is only part of your job. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, uh, uh, but no, I was just curious about what you thought about, because I, I, every once in a while I have the opportunity to talk to people about this, uh, had a photographer on uh, uh, a while back who, you know, just loves, loves film, uh, doesn't shoot it all the time because it's just a, a economics thing, but still loves, you know, loves Minox, you know, loves tiny film formats and Polaroid 20 by 24 and, you know, all through the range because they just give you something, they give you this look that, you can't really replicate digitally. You can try, but um, you I, know. I bought two film cameras this year. <laughs> oh, what did you what did you get? <laughs> I bought an old Leica M6, and I got uh, my buddy's uh, I, he's my buddy John Rooney, who's actually a really good f street photographer in LA. He sold me his twenty uh, seven or twenty eight millimeter. I think it's twenty eight millimeter lens. So I just I keep that on my M6 all the time. And then I bought a Mamiya. Uh, um, a Mamiya six medium format camera, one twenty six by six. Uh, it's one twenty. So it's yeah. a, and it's and it's about one one lens. It's like a seventy five millimeter, which I think is like a fifty millimeter equivalent in thirty five millimeter terms. And I just I shoot film again, and it is, it's pretty great. I mean, I, do, I do, I do, I do miss it. And I bought a Fuji XT three, so I have a, I bought that this year too. Huh. So I'm I've been getting back in, and. All one lens for each one of the cameras. I don't really kind of change lenses. I, I like the discipline of knowing what that exactly, that yeah. what that focal length is on the camera, yeah. and uh, and knowing where I should be to get that particular shot. That's what somebody told me when I was just starting out was that you know if you want to if you want to get really good at you know photography, just shoot with a fifty. It's a really hard lens to use, you know, because you can't get too close to people with it. It uh, it gives you, you know, nice control of the depth of field and it's a good discipline than having to zoom, you know, like we talked some at some point a while ago about, you know, zooming with your feet, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, it makes you think, it makes you compose as opposed to changing lenses and stuff. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I agree with it. You know, like oftentimes I'll use, I still like to use primes on set. Uh, if I'm using zooms, I usually like to use zooms for zooms. I don't like to use them as variable primes often. Um, I like the discipline of being able to, camera should be here. And we, and 40, 40 millimeter here, two feet from the ground. And we can make choices. Mm. And then, you know, there's a little bit, I do like that discipline. Mm. So you you talked a little about, um, you know, about fighting, uh, bucking a trend. And we were talking before we came on about, uh, you know, you were on, I forget what film you were on, uh, where the director wanted to start with close-ups. And you were like, what? Yeah, um, so my director, on, uh, I recently finished shooting this television show out in California called American Princess. The premiere is in June. It was a show for Tenji Cohen and uh, Jamie Denbo. And it's about a, a young girl, Upper West Side, a uh, young lady whose life falls apart and she runs away to a renaissance fair. <laughs> and um, it's a large, ca like Glow, it's a large cast of characters and um, a lot of cross shooting, a lot of uh, three camera days. Um, a lot of lighting for sets because you know they have tons of people. It's um, it's a difficult thing, and usually what we end up doing is we'll shoot wides, and then we'll go in for coverage after. You know, Genji shows a very specific nature of how they like to do things in terms of coverage, and um, and then this director Jude Wang came on, and Jude is extremely experienced, um, and but she has a methodology of working that is the exact opposite of what we were doing on the show, which is she likes to start shooting close-ups first and her reasoning for this is kind of almost like the reasoning of the discipline of shooting film in that she finds often that uh, people will get lazy in wides 
and not really deliver what they're going to deliver until they get into close-ups. And then it almost always renders those wides or those establishing shots unusable because the very nature of the way the performances are structured or how they deliver lines or whatever yeah. are completely different than they are in the close-up. And so she likes starting with close-ups because it raises the stakes immediately for the actors and saying, we're going to use this stuff. And then actors give everything that they've been holding back on or they think they're going to hold back on for their close-ups. And we have usable stuff from the get-go. So it saves time from a production standpoint. You're immediately getting the best stuff and the, the most uh, invested stuff from your actors. And then you just work your way out and build. And then by the time you get to the beginning, you can start to build in camera moves and whatnot in the master that are actually going to be hopefully usable because the performances are going to be where you want them to be. And oftentimes um, that stuff gets cut because mm -hmm. the performances aren't exactly where they want to or the joke doesn't exactly play the way they want to. And then wides end up getting uh, uh, cast aside in the edit um, because the performances aren't exactly where they were until they got into the close-ups and the actors were delivering the way they thought that those moments were going to be used. And I had never done that methodology before, but I found her reasoning for it fascinating. So we did it, and... Uh, and it, it was definitely something that the crew kind of bucked on. They Very little, very few of the people liked working that way. Hmm. But I found from a usability standpoint that the performances were better. So in that regard, I, I, I kind of bought in whole hard to her, uh, whole hog to her, uh, her, her uh, You're ideas. You're a convert. And I'm, yeah. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody, mm -hmm. but... For Jude and the way she likes to work, I found it really refreshing. And it was actually a nice way to kind of uh, jostle us from a production standpoint and kind of kept everybody on their toes. Well, talk a little bit about what we were talking about before, before we came on about um, camera and comedy and how uh, the, the difference in, in technique in that sense. Well, I mean, for comedy, you know, like, I mean, I don't, I just kind of light the way I light. You know, I don't necessarily keep anything really high key unless, like in a traditionally comedic sense, unless it's something that has been talked about in a specific manner with creators, whether it's a show or a mm -hmm. TV show or a film. But in terms of camera, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing with cameras that, you know, like for Genji shows, they have a pretty particular methodology with the way they like to work and they have a wish list of what they want. You know, they want... They want to be able to cut any lines at all, you know, because of a joke. I mean, that's the thing about that's a great, that's the unfortunate and the great thing about comedy, is the fact that if someone laughs, you know, then it works. If someone doesn't, if someone doesn't laugh, then you know it doesn't work. So the barometer for whether or not comedy is is working or whether or not is pretty cut and dry. Right. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, you know, when you're cutting for the laugh, you know, camera kind of gets tossed to the side, you know terms of the way you structure something you as a cinematographer may say we're going to have this big shot and it moves in on a techno crane it's going to push in through all these people go over this pool past this guy who's swimming by in a raft and it's going to settle in on this two shot and then she's going to say this line and then it's funny and then all of a sudden they'll do that techno crane shot and then they're like you know this joke doesn't really work it only works in a close-up and that techno crane shot is gone um that stuff happens all the time um on Glow when we shot second season, I mean, I can't tell you how much, how many feet of camera moves are on that cutting room floor, but they're just, you know, it's, if it doesn't work for the comedy, that's it. And for Genji's group, it's like, you know, like we want two eyes on every line, you know, so they don't want jokes playing in profile. Everybody gets coverage and they don't like wonders because now they can't affect the pacing in terms of the comedic edit. So from a camera standpoint, you know, in the beginning, I was like, oh, let's do this. We have the steady cam that pulls over to here and do this and this and that. And what I learned after d in the middle of doing that show was, was like they don't, you know, like that doesn't really matter to this particular group. So, like, they want to use camera to be a joke delivery system as opposed to the camera being something really cinematic that kind of aids in the storytelling. The joke is the story. And whether or not, like, dramatic moments are different in the context of a dramedy show, but in terms of comedy... You know, like that is the great leveler. So camera doesn't really matter in that regard for this particular group. So you have to be very careful with the way you plot and use camera as a cinematographer. You may say you want to move camera all over the place, but if your camera move is going to end up getting cut halfway through or three quarters of the way through or even a, even one line into the move, 
am I going to spend 45 minutes of my day lining up this camera move shot that I know is going to get cut right. and limit my time later on for something I really want? And as a cinematographer, one of the great lessons as you start to shoot is learning the style of the show from a, in a TV sense, the style of the show and how you use that time management. Is it worth it? Is it going to survive the edit? And that's, a, and that's something as a cinematographer you really have to pay attention to because you can end up wasting a ton of time on camera movements and whatnot for shots that aren't going to really play. I mean, there's a shot in American Princess that you know cost a ton of money, um, and I don't even think it made the edit hmm. because uh, it's, a, it's like a 50-foot technocrane shot. It's gone. <laughs> and I was remember I was watching the cut, and I was like, where is the, Oh, my God. <laughs> but then I saw why they cut it, and I was like, I can't argue with it because it works and it's funny and it makes sense. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you kind of have to, a cinematographer has to give everything in their all in terms of comedy using the camera as cinematically as possible. But you can't ignore the nature of the edit, the style of the show, the requirements of the creators and the directors and how it's going to play. And it's going to be timed. It's got to be timed. Yeah. So you're going to have to be really specific. Now working in film, like Night Owls is a perfect example. Night Owls is a film I did with Charles Hood. Charles knew that we had two actors in a house over the course of 90 minutes, essentially. And you had to be very specific. And he didn't want to do handheld, where you're just kind of like, you know, you, you allow... Why? Why didn't he want to do handheld? He didn't want to do it all the way through the movie because it would just be visually monotonous. And then at a certain point, you kind of using the... Because your location was pretty, was yeah, pretty oh, yes. limited. Yes, so it's basically it's one house. Yeah. And then at that point, like you end up using the crutch of handheld to kind of create visual tension because it's always moving, it's never really perfect, and it kind of can end up almost becoming a visual yeah, crutch. Sense. Makes sense. So, like, Charles and I very specifically plotted all the camera moves for Night Owls to feel very naturalistic and organic, but in a classicist kind of way. So we had shots that ended with a dolly shot in a very specific manner. Like, this dolly shot will travel here to here, and it can play as the two shot. So it would, like dolly track, dolly track would be laid in one way to make it feel like it would come into a two shot and then it would play as the master. But then there'd be a second half of the scene and then what we would end up doing is laying a dolly track in another direction in the exact same two shot that we ended the first part with. So it would feel visually the same and then the person would get up and then the camera would travel. So the audience would never be able to have this kind of sense that kind of if an audience audiences are really experienced and 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 and, and well versed nowadays and if they can end up understanding the shot structure in terms of the edit their their kind of expectation of what's going to happen visually can end up lulling them in a way into checking their phone or being distracted and we wanted to use camera in a way that was like familiar to them and then change at the last in in, in, hmm. in unexpected ways yeah so that's, that, an, that's an interesting thing because you know you think about you know because there's just so much content out there now that people are so much more cinema literate yeah than they were you know when there wasn't you know even in vhs days or what have you sure you know people weren't watching as many films so there's sounds like there's kind of like uh you know audiences are savvy to a to a uh, uh you know uh, uh style of movement of you know how it's orchestrated but on the film that you're talking about was it um was it storyboarded or it, just basically plotted no as very specifically plotted shot list yeah the, the Ch charles would use some s storyboarding sometimes but w but our shot lists were so specific i mean like to the line like mm -hmm. on this line they're going to get up and then this camera will no longer be on this dolly track it'll be on this dolly track that will then take us over to this couch area and that begins the second half of the scene. So it was very specifically visually plotted. But you're also talking about a movie that only costs $140,000. And that's a movie that we, you know, like we, we knew exactly how much money we had. We knew exa exactly how much money we could use and how we can use the camera in a movement sort of way to create dynamics. And then we would be able to say, we would have these very specific dolly moves in classic kind of compo com com compositions. And then, then we would be able to be like, okay, we did this scene classic. Let's do this next scene handheld. And then this next scene, we'll go back to, we'll go to Steadicam. And that way, none of the movie felt like it was one extended, similar kind of feel. 
visually. Yeah, you brought the trailer for that, so let me take a quick look at that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey, Peter. I'm in Will's house. Okay. Well, you need to explain to me why you're there. I, 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 after you guys left the banquet, I met this girl, and, and then I, I went back to her house. I'm gonna go upstairs. Hello? Lady? Only problem is, it's not her house. It's, uh, it's Will's house. Where is she now? I have to call you back. No. Lady! Oh, God. Hey, get up! Oh. Did you take some... Did you take something? Oh! Hi, doctor, thank you so much. We're not out of the woods yet. You're just gonna have to keep her awake. Keep her awake? What happens if she falls asleep? Well, then her brain will stop sending the signal to her lungs that she needs to breathe. But you're not gonna let that happen, so we have to worry about that, do we? I would like to know why we are in my boss's house. Don't let her talk to anyone. That's for you. Don't let her leave. <laughs> that might be a bit of a challenge. I am begging you, do not back out of this room. Dude, let go. Oh! <gasps> How's it going there, champ? You know, I think uh, pretty good. Everything seems to be under control. <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's like, but like, when you're a filmmaker, you have to know, like, what are your, what are your strengths, right? And it's like, you have two actors, Rosa and Adam, who are really fantastic comedically they have magnificent chemistry you don't need to go insane with camera like we we had a very specific plan but it's like at the end of the day like you're gonna be resting the film on these on these actors so you want the camera to be present you want it to be important part of the storytelling you don't want it to get in the way and then you're like and then like when you have great elements then you can improvise like there's a scene on the couch of that movie we played uh, the the whole scene kind of like uh, is all um, handheld the, the second half of the scene and then there's like a three and a half minute scene at the end of that handheld scene with them on the couch where they, they come and sit across from each other on the same couch and then it's three and a half minutes and we had no time left and I was like we're not going to be able to shoot four setups for this and I'm like Charles is like how do we make this different I'm like well why don't we just do a handheld dolly so basically, we start on an ultra tight close up two shot and two three five uh, aspect ratio. And the great thing about two three five is that that wide aspect ratio allows you to shoot essentially two close ups at once. So, you know, we have basically this super tight two shot profile on the both of them. And then my dolly grip pulled me back, had the camera on my knee, and over three and a half minutes, you know, that slowly just pulls out and there's no other coverage and it's just them. And then they transitioned to this scene outside at, uh, um, at the swimming pool. And we did four takes. It took us, uh, we had it budgeted for, I think it was like three hours of shooting, those three and a half pages. And, uh, and I knew we were getting killed on the second half of the day because of a, a problem with our pool. Uh, it wasn't heated. And oh. the other half of the day, we were going to have to come up with something. So I knew I had to buy more time for that. Because the scene wasn't even, the scene wasn't even written at that point because we had to rewrite it because the pool was no longer heated and we couldn't put actors in this cold pool. <laughs> so I had needed to shave in that that day. And about an hour before, I was like talking to my AD, and, and he was like, "We need to lose two hours out of this scene. How do we do that?" Wow. And it was like, "Let's yeah. do this handheld dolly thing." And it took us forty-five minutes to shoot it. Got that time back, and we needed every second of it. I think that day we shot until the sun came up, and then uh, that wrapped us because the scene, the movie takes place entirely at night, except right. for the very ending. <clears throat> but it was something where, you know, something that worked visually within the plan. It helped us production-wise. It helped with the actors, and it was just a solution that I was able to improvise on the spot because of the fact that all the elements are so good. You can trust in the fact that these actors are going to be able to do three and a half minutes with no coverage and make it really compelling. Hmm. Well, you, you mentioned Glow before, and we didn't really touch on that because that's a pretty popular series, Netflix series. Um, let's watch a, Let's watch a, the uh, the trailer from that, and then talk a, talk a little about it after we do. Sure. 
One, two, three. Oh, yeah. oh fuck. It's our film. Ladies, exciting stuff. Feels a little different around here. And we got a few men in the gym finally. Woo! Hubba hubba. All right, don't distract them. They have work to do. I'm excited. Aren't you excited? My costume still smells like beer and racism. Was I supposed to wash these? Did you have a good break? Yeah. Just getting divorced. It's complicated. Usually you do a lot better job of keeping your weird friendship stuff out of the ring. Just hope she can keep up. You're on the show, right? Glow. Uh, welfare queen. <laughs> What'd you call my mom? It's a wrestling show. I'm not the only offensive character. Everyone's offensive. We have fans. I mean, the girls get letters. There's weirdos waiting outside for me. Wait. You're my favorite. I can see that. We're gonna be canceled. I can't believe this. I think this might have something to do with me. That is how this business works. It shouldn't be that way. They gave a men's wrestling show our slot. So you just let them do whatever they want? Nuh -uh. Fuck no. Fuck no. Fuck Fuck no. 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 What are we gonna do about it? I say we do whatever the hell we want to do. Set the weirdos free and see what happens. If you want to be respected, you gotta make yourself useful. I know what I'm worth, and I'm not apologizing to anyone. Everything is going to be hard. I forgot to pick up my son at daycare today. I don't want to make this show that. Who's ready to do this? But I know this is going to be hard. But I believe in miracles, and we are going to make this miracle happen. We are the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Older, you can talk about it with your therapist. <laughs> well, I mean, the, uh, you know, off the bat, I think one of the challenges of doing that is uh, the cast. I mean, it's such a such a huge cast. What's what was that like? Well, I mean, you know, it's that's a really that's probably the biggest thing to deal with in terms of like uh, the cinematography <clears throat> is, you know, like the first season that Christian Sprenger shot is really really dark you know it's like it's uh it's it's in a beautiful way and i have the in the second season we had some some things that were going to make it a little bit more difficult to run in the same strict visual uh, kind of like a outlook that they had for season one yeah. you know there was a lot more scenes where they had tons of of, of characters you know almost the entire cast and in, in, in whole scenes and then you're trying to do it with less time, less money uh, than the first season. Um, and it's just something where you have to light to be able to protect for all these different skin tones, all these different shapes of faces. And, uh, and the, the one thing I try and do is, is kind of maintain some type of visual continuity between what Christian did first season and what we wanted to do second season. You know, there's some very specific things like the way the, the set is lit uh, for the the gym, the way I mean everything is pretty much practically motivated in that space. You know so whether it's like sunlight through windows, mm -hmm. or some type of industrial kind of fixtures that play in this kind of industrial park where the uh, the gym is. Um, what was the light? What was the light? How did you light the the actual uh, the actual ring? The ring is actually lit from a set of uh, hanging practicals over the the gym. Uh, the the, of the bare bulbs. The, uh, but they're they're like the fluorescent bulbs. Yeah. Um, but they were quasar bulbs that we had put and replaced for our our own purposes. But basically the same thing. And I also know that the first season they had done some salt and pepper, which means they had cold and warm bulbs in in the, in the ring. But we were going to be dealing with shooting with that exact same space as the actual glow ring. And that motivation for those lights were going to be almost strictly tungsten. So I wanted to give some visual differentiation between a space we're going to see a heck of a lot of over 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. So I kept those lights cooler in the ring for the day so that we would have more contrast with the night performance stuff, which is almost solely tungsten in those rings. And then, um, and then there is a, these, uh, windows that sur that kind of surround the gym. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we lit through, uh, those with some smaller fixtures because we were really, really tight to the rafters on this stage. 
and basically all you can really do is kind of glow those windows. They're not really practical in the sense that you drive light through them to create shape and space in, in that space. So it's it's um it's really difficult to light with specificity in that kind of space with that many people. Uh, it's uh, so it was a lot of negatives and a lot of negative fill, a lot of supplemental lighting that uh, I'm not sure if they did the first season to try and give shape to the key lights on these people. Yeah. And it's um it's something where like you just have to find that balance between giving as much contrast and shape and kind of dynamic to the look on people's faces and having enough uh, light to be able to kind of carry it over to multiple people when you're shooting with two or three cameras at a time. Now, when they schedule something like that, do they give, uh, do they give enough uh, leeway to, uh, to the, the difficulty of the, of that you're just talking about, of the cast, of the varied skin tones and all the setups that that might require? No, they don't really do that. Um, you know, <laughs> Bluntly, like, no. And no, an AD will come to you and be like, listen, these are my estimates for the time. And like, <clears throat> then you'll look at it and you'll be like, no, 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 I need this much more time for this. But then at the end of the day, you know, like if you take that time from that, that means you're going to be taking the time from something else right. that you need for later on. Right. And like, there's only so much time you have during the day. So it's like, even with overtime, which is not something any producer wants to hear about, but like, like how much time do I need this extra half hour here or am I really going to need it for that scene inside the the hotel room you know which has eight people in a hotel room that is about the size of the studio you know it's like and it's it's just kind of funny because you don't you do have the room to work and a studio space but when you jam as many sets into our <laughs> studio space you, that kind of room goes out the window and it's just something where it's like you know you just have to be economical and as you have to kind of balance art, art and commerce. Commerce meaning the amount of money you have to actually be able to produce the show with what you see of it from a cinematography well, standpoint. Well, plus you said how many primary characters are in that show? I think there's about 13 or 14 series regulars. Um, so it's <laughs> quite – and then wow. you have you know, and you have dark <laughs> skin tones. You have women who have very shallow faces, round faces. You have women with very angular faces, and you have women with deeper set eyes. There's all different kinds of things that you're always going to have to modulate and be right. careful about. Right. Like you might light an area and be like, okay, let's run for the sing for the for the wide, and then you get into close up, and some people need more help. Mm -hmm. Some people have very specific things with their faces. I mean, and that's the the thing. The funny thing about dealing with digital is that as much as you want to, you know, you're dealing with cameras that are shooting, you know, high resolution with with state of the art lenses, even with a heavy kind of uh, color correct that gives it this kind of aged look that uh, that we did at uh, Light Iron. There are certain things that you just have to try and protect your your, your talent as much as possible. And um, and while still maintaining the, the mood of of the show. You know? So you mentioned lenses. Let's talk a little bit about lens selection. Yeah. Um, so if you're, you know, you're looking at a, a period piece, whether the period be the 60s or the 80s or something like that, how does that how does that bear in your mind as far as lens selection? Well, I mean, I you know the, there is a big rush for vintage glass, whether it's a, a modern day telling of a movie or if it's something classic. But you know, I really think I'm kind of along the lines of Fincher, David Fincher, when they did Mindhunter, was like you know like costume, hair and makeup, production design, those are the things that are going to sell. Period. And uh, I kind of in, in the belief of that I can't, you know, like I, there are certain things I can do in terms of using slightly older lenses or a little bit more diffusion or something specific in terms of color correction. But that's usually a cocktail I balance with, you know, like I used to own a set of super Baltar lenses, right? And they were beautiful. But, you know, the corners and edges for a couple of those lenses were unusable for wides. You know, for something, a show like Glow, where I know I'm going to be dealing with five or six people in the frame, you know, edge to edge sharpness is a pretty big deal. Say, are they how soft were they? You no, know, I mean, well, the Baltars are super soft, but even the Cook anamorphic lenses that we used on Glow, which were a carryover from the first season um, uh, that Christian had used for the show, um, like even with a, even at a fairly deep, and they shot 2.8, they shot them all the way open. Oh, did they? Oh. I never shot that open. I thought there was about a 2.8 and a half was the most I ever went um, four and often at a four because I thought the edge to edge sharpness kind of fell off pretty precipitously and 
at that point, that always looks a little bit weird to me when I've got a four shot and everybody in is in focus except for the person on the left side of the frame. Yeah. You know, like that kind of stuff always, that kind of, say. that always kind of bothers me a little bit more. Um, you know, and that's a funny thing about, and again, this goes back to that conversation about comedy driving cinematography. Yeah. You know, if you've got a, if you've got, if you've got a, a, a scene with rapid fire dialogue like Glow does, where it's a lot of tit for tat, you know, really quick rapid fire dialogue, almost like screwball comedy in a sense. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like the the great thing about having coverage is that it gives you the options, but the difficult thing about it is that it results in cuts that can sometimes feel more schizophrenic and choppy than they should if they just played in a wide. I mean, there is something to say about going back to classic, the way classic comedies are shot, like, uh, you know, like My Man Godfrey or like you know, the La Cava film or, or uh, you know, like anything by Preston Sturgis or Lubitsch, where like, you know, you have wider pieces that are able to hold that dialogue. You know, it just plays better when you have rapid fire stuff, not cutting to single, to single, to single. Right, right. But if you have, a, <clears throat> but if you have scripts that are fairly loose, where you want to be able to cut uh, dialogue at any point, you know, that could, you can have the greatest plan in the world about keeping the camera, you know, like uh, uh, the camera work very cohesive, not choppy. But if they start cutting lines, I mean, then your camera's at the mercy of the edit at that point. And then whatever you plan for visual smoothness or kind of having a, a cohesion in terms of the edit not feeling too choppy, when you want to edit that much in terms of the content of the show, like your cinematography is basically relegated to the... Uh, to the whims of the edit mm. so you know it's it's a it's a difficult thing so when it comes down to lenses you know and sharpness and edge to edge and what you want to choose i think sometimes that lens choices uh are kind of secondary to me than to lighting you know because i could shoot i've done shows with cook i've done sh- shows with panavision uh zeiss lenses um you know master primes and uh i shot master primes in the house of cards stuff and stuff looked great super happy with it you know, but you have so much room in the color correct now. You can really change the very nature of the cinematography. And uh, at this point, all these lenses render faces really beautifully. There's different ideas about what dimensionality, you know, like the way the, the 3D dimensionality that cooks render faces in versus the kind of pictorial beauty of like Panavision Primo glass and the kind of uh, kind of pristine, kind of perfectly engineered kind of look of like Master Primes. But you can affect the way that photography looks dramatically in the color correct. So you can shoot something clean like I did the House of Cards spots wide open on, on Master Primes. And the color correction just makes it look kind of like buttery and beautiful, perfect. And can just and be totally yeah. tweaked and grading. Yeah, mm-hmm. as long as you have enough room on your negative. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, that's my responsibility as well. But, so my, but for me, I, I kind of stay away from vintage glass now uh, for the most part. Um, you know, because I just I just like the feeling of modern glass better. And if I want to create something more heavy in terms of a period look, I'll do it in the context of the color correct. We'll talk a little about the look on the on another clip that you brought in from Ava's Possessions. Uh, l- let's take a quick look at that and we can talk about it. You need to learn to be a little more cutthroat. Well, when I was possessed, I cut some throats. <laughs> no, really. I was possessed. My name's Ava. This My demon was exercised on Tuesday. It's like AA for people like you. Once you've been possessed, you are ten times more likely to be repossessed. You acted like a mega bitch while you were possessed. And a slut. Which is fine. Bloody maniac running through the streets, hurting people who usually go to jail. Jail? Yeah. What are you gonna do about picking up the pieces of your life? Is anyone calling sick for me? Uh... Woo! Forces like these, they leave their mark. Just hope there are no more surprises. Good luck with that. to 
must be drinking. Haven't you heard? I can handle my spirits. So influences on that. I mean, I was immediately thinking of one of the films that influenced me a lot as a in high school was uh, The Exorcist. I think I s- probably saw it like five times in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, like Jordan Galland is the director of that, writer-director <coughs> of that picture. And Jordan is, you know, he's one of those filmmakers where like whatever he said, I trusted it. He's one of those filmmakers who has a really kind of encyclopedic knowledge not just a film, but a, he's a musician. He knows everything about music. He's an artist. He, he draws and paints. Like, he really knows everything about everything. It's kind of insane. So when he talks about the nature of what he believes a project should be, there's a kind of great sense of comfort because he makes really economical pictures that usually do really well. And, you know, when he sent me the script for this, I remember I read it. I was like, well, this sounds amazing. And then he sent me his mood board, which is exhaustively complex in terms of like the references there's everything from the exorcist to stuff like uh giallo films and uh, argento and i remember that one of the first things i i have is like a baseline uh, for a film is like like what is the not just the, the style of photography is you know obviously people have references but you know like people have specific ideas about cinematography being an active or an objective participant in terms of the storytelling. Hmm. And I remember the first thing I asked, one of the first things I asked him was like, what is, is this photography supposed to be felt? Is this like, do you feel the photography in this film? Or is it something that like we're creating this universe and there are hints of this photography and lighting that kind of play within the context of the world? Or is this, are we playing something with, larger swaths of brush strokes where the film really, you can feel it lit in a way that isn't particularly natural, but like feels like the world is, the photography is imposing itself on the world. And he said, no, the photography should be felt. So this isn't a film that from a style standpoint, it's supposed to feel like a world. And then like, it's, it's supposed to be this kind of idea that you're bought into and it feels like natural and you buy into it. It's something where there's like style is heavy on the forefront of the picture, you know, and it's just something where like there's a scene where Lou Taylor and Louise are coming on the staircase and I was like, we have this big dramatic yellow light come from behind that's all lit up with smoke. And then I was like, well, like I don't really have a lot of room here to key them. What should we do? And he was like, well, we should, uh, you know, let's do something bold. So suddenly we did this kind of Dean Cundy Halloween-esque, heavily blue-fronted key light. And that's not supposed to be something... Now, normally I would never do anything that... If I was trying to create a world that was, like, natural, I usually don't do that kind of stuff. But this is a world where, like, he wanted these kind of large brushstrokes of photography. And you open yourself up to a lot of criticism in terms of that stuff if you're going to buy into it. But like we talked about before in terms of, like, trying to make an impact with film because there is so much out there. Like, you know, Jordan likes to have bold storytelling strokes, and that's what that photography is. Well, the huge splashes of color everywhere. Yeah, you know? ton, and, and even color that doesn't necessarily make sense. Right. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, there's lights coming through her, her, her window in her apartment, and I was like, well, you know, like, I, I don't necessarily believe naturalism is important, frankly. I mean, I, I usually embrace a kind of sense of heightened naturalism, but I don't really need naturalism for something to be Well, it's also, in this case, it's supernatural. Yeah. I mean, the the storyline is yeah. supernatural, you know, so it, it yeah. kind of jibes with that. You know? Yeah, you know, it's like, I mean, like, <clears throat> do I really buy that green light coming through the window in Vertigo? Do I really buy that, you know, that, that, that light coming in the, from that neon sign and uh, when Jimmy Stewart is uh, and first changing, uh, uh, what's her name, Kim Novak into Kim Novak again? <laughs> right. And it's just like, you know, and uh, like, no, I don't necessarily believe it but I buy the feeling of it. And that's a lot of what that photography was for, for Jordan. You know, that's a funny thing about, again, embracing low budget. Uh, we had no time to light the finale. And he's like, I, I want this to feel crazier. Mm-hmm. I want this to feel a little bit more different than anything else. And we were shooting with the Zeiss super speed lenses. On our, those were our still lenses. And uh, Ingenue zooms for the, uh, for the rest of it because we actually used zooms as active zooms and a kind of throwback to 70s mm-hmm. style stuff. And um, and those Zeiss super speed lenses, you know, at two eight they look amazing, but if you shoot them wide open at one three, 
you get this really kind of like bloomy, different kind of feeling to the lenses completely. And that last scene uh, when she goes through this possession thing again, we shot the whole scene wide open. Um, and uh, to kind of give it this sense of something, just to throw out some different visual dynamic for the end. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, was also, uh, it was also a wonderful uh, uh, kind of like fortuitous thing because I had lost my gaffer for that day. And, uh, and when I had asked for certain lights to be put up for that scene, lights that were basically half of the, the power of what I asked for were put into place. And at that time, we didn't have enough time to relight. So, but I always light for at least a two eight, two eight and a half on my on my light meter, which I still use to light, and um, and I knew that even though it was dark at two eight, that I we could then shoot the wide open, get the different visual look, and then I would have enough light if I opened up from those two stops uh. to be able to not cost us any more time. Again, uh, time management <laughs> mixed with artistic <laughs> intent, um, mixed with uh, being responsible to your producers and. Yeah. And uh, it just ended up kind of kind of working, but you know, that's the thing. You can take you can take great chances with cinematography if you if you if you're careful and you're and you're and you're you uh, you protect yourself in terms of your photography. I always end up giving myself a little extra stop uh, just to be able to, just in case just in case maybe the focus puller has a tough day and needs a little bit more stop or their eyes are tired at the end of a fourteen hour day. Hmm. Maybe they need an extra half stop, you know. I can, I'll light at a 500 ISO in camera, and if they need a little bit extra, I can jump back up to 800 to a thousand, give them an extra two thirds of a stop or something to be able to focus a little bit better. Yeah. You know, it's I protect myself that way, so uh, I can make sure I don't end up. Uh, I can make sure my crew doesn't. You know, I can help my crew, and I can still get what I want to from a photographic standpoint. Yeah, cool. So, so you had you know as we talked at the beginning, you had a really uh, a really interesting hard scrabble, uh, yeah. you know, beginning in the in the industry. Oh yeah. <clears throat> what do you um, What do you say to uh, how you think the business has changed now for <clears throat> people that are, you know, young people that are in your in your place currently, and you know, in the in the line of you know maybe what you do as far as mentorship, or what you would say as far as advice and how to get into the the business. Well, um, the, the path might be a little more different now. Well, I mean, you know, like there are a lot of, there isn't one, the one great thing about the nature of filmmaking now is that it's not like it was 50 years ago. You know, you don't need to have an uncle who's uh, in 52 to, to get your, your foot into the door. You know, like I, it really does not take a lot to work in film in the beginning because um, I PA'd for three years, you know. And I think everybody should PA. I think it is invaluable because it teaches you humility, teaches you set etiquette, and it really helps you appreciate all the departments, including your own, including production. You know, I mean, that's the funny thing. I remember I once tried to get a friend a job on set, and he said, I don't want to be a set monkey. So he just, it was on, it was on uh, Pieces of April, it was on Peter Hedges' film, We Need PAs. And he said, uh, I don't want to be a set monkey. And I was like, okay. All right, you know, and uh, I was a set monkey, and uh, I was on that film too. And it's the funny thing is, like, you have to. I found being the 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 thing about being in film production is the one thing someone always asks me about, like, what are the things to be uh, to be su a successful in the film industry. This is not just applied to cinematography, film filmmaking in general, but from a production standpoint, is be on time, work hard. And the, the last thing is uh, is be kind. Um, be a good person. And that don't sound silly, but when I'm on set, I'm with these people 14 hours a day, minimum. It's 12 hours of shooting. I'm always there early eating breakfast. I'm there after we call wrap. It's about 14 hours a day. So in that regard, I see these people more than I see my family. You know? I was, uh, when I was doing Glow and American Princess back to back, I was away from... I live in Connecticut. I was in Los Angeles for 10 out of the last uh, 12 months. So, you know, like I don't get to see my, my wife a lot in that time. I don't get to see it. I'm, a lot of my friends. I'm around the people in the film industry. So when I hire people, if those people aren't kind, 
if they aren't nice people, if I don't like being around them more than I like being around my family, you don't get hired again. You'll get a job once, you know? You get a job, sure. Anybody can get hired pretty much. But if you're not a good person, if people don't like, if you're not kind, if people don't like being around you for 14 hours a day, you ain't gonna, unless you're a supernaturally talented person, you know, it's very difficult to survive a film career. You know, now, of course, if you go to Sundance with a big film and you become a hit and whatever, obviously your 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 career is conjured out of thin air for, at that point, you know, and you can you can ride the the coattails of that success and build from there. But those stories are always the exceptions. There's a reason they become popular stories because they're fanciful. You know, there's that great story about Vittorio Storaro, you know, saying like I had a kid on the way and they wanted me to do something cinematography wise and I said no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm, and they quit the film because because even back then I was Vittorio Storaro. And I can understand it. He's one of the greatest cinematographers of all time. But there are probably a thousand other Vittorio Storaros who probably did the same thing and never work again. Mm. You know? And it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, like not everybody like Kevin Smith makes a movie on their credit card and is able to sell it and then become a, you know, have a career for 25 years. For the most part, people who succeed in filmmaking from a... I mean, like in terms of a biggest sample size are people who work hard, are kind, and on time. Those those three, three things are the, the simplest thing you can do, and they're one of the greatest factors about your, you being a success. In terms of specifics about being successful as a cinematographer, I mean, there are so many options nowadays, you know? And, like, I don't... If you're going to buy equipment to give yourself a leg up in the beginning, you know, like, you really have to be careful... Because the nature of, of, of technology is moving so fast. Yes. I remember so true. when I bought, I was in, I was 2004, and then my JVC had blown up, <laughs> literally had blown up after I'd used it on a film, and I didn't, was going to get another camera, and I remember specifically the two cameras. It was an HVX200 Panasonic camera, because I was a Vericam fan, and I loved the way the color signs on that camera looked, and the HVX200 was a HD camera, and I was like, I can buy this camera for... Eight thousand dollars and get Is a work P two, P two. Yeah. So yeah, and I was like, wow, this I got an HD camera. I can make some great stuff, and this will further my career. Or I could save that money, and I can give a thousand dollars to Jim Gennard, and I can put a down payment on a Red One camera and get a four K camera. And at that time, four K was being listed as like, oh, that's a thirty five millimeter equivalent. Blah 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 blah. And I was like, if I can get a camera that shoots thirty five millimeter stuff, I should be able to make my reel look that much better, right. shoot that much <coughs> yeah, high, right. higher level of production. So I gave Red $1,000. I was Red Camera 321 when I bought it. And, I mean, I got my agent off that camera. I can literally say I got my agent off that camera because I shot three projects in 2008 with it. And then the Long Island International Film Expo asked me to come and do a presentation on the Red Camera. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know how to use the Red Camera and I can talk to people about it. So I brought my camera, brought the whole rig. Huh. And I did a presentation on it, and my agent, at, who wasn't my agent at the time, saw me and said, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I got a meeting because of a film, that's because good. of a camera presentation, and I got signed, and that's how I got my, my first agent. So, I mean, now, <laughs> when I got down to it, at the end of it, I sold most of my camera, all my camera equipment, uh, two years ago, because it wasn't really helping me anymore. Because at that point, when you're working on small movies, you know, you're not really making a ton of money, but you're making enough to keep to maintain your camera package, maybe get a few upgrades for a couple pieces of equipment you want, maybe a better transmitter, a better follow focus, whatever. But it just wasn't financially feasible for me at that point anymore. But in the beginning, making really much higher quality stuff, I was able to shoot uh, on my RED camera and give that to productions so that I wasn't shooting on a really cheap camera. That made the films better. That made my work better. Mm. It was a it was a viable thing, and then I made a choice at a certain point to say, you know what, the dividends aren't the same anymore, and I sold everything. Yeah. And you just really, as a filmmaker, have to be a cinematographer specifically. You have to be really cognizant of the technology, you know, because at a certain point, I had the red camera, six K red dragon, and people were like, uh, we kind of want to use the weapon, we kind of want to use the helium, we kind of use the monstro, and at that point, I was like, okay. If I don't keep spending fifty grand every six months, <laughs> right. 
I'm getting buried here. And it wasn't yeah. like an Alexa where, you know, the cameras, the, the sensor technology is six years old, but it's still the best looking camera sensor from a lot of people's. And like, you could still shoot with a, um, an airy camera, one of the original Alexas in 2k and get a, a beautiful looking picture. And people don't question that, but red was a different animal. So, and you're, and you're going to run into that with all kinds of cameras now, whether it's black magic or some mini or whatever. But the bottom line is, as a young cinematographer right now, you can go out and buy a small DSLR camera for a fraction of the cost I spent. Uh, I spent $100,000 on my first camera package. You can get a camera package that shoots a better looking camera than my original stuff for you know, ten grand at the most. Mm. And you can shoot beautiful stuff now. So I think as a cinematographer starting out, you just have to get out there and keep shooting. And choose, wi- choose wisely. And choose wisely. Yeah. Do not be frivolous. Don't... The one thing I would caution against greatly is like, don't think I need a camera and then just rush to buy a camera. Because, I mean, I would definitely use caution and patience when it comes to that. Yeah. And the one final thing I'll say about career, you have to be prepared for the need for perseverance. I mean, let's be frank. I mean, like I did a lot of small, low-budget indies for a long time. The highest profile thing I ever got without question was Glow. I started in the late 90s, and, um, you know, like, I've had films that done very well. Night Owls is, well, when, it, we got, when it went to Sundance, uh, excuse me, when it went to South by Southwest Film Festival, uh, Ava's and, and Night Owls were actually, I had two features in that year. Night Owls did incredibly well. It got incredible reviews. It did so well, it got a buzz screening added to it. It was one of the films that were talked about at the festival. It did really great. It got released later on. It was 100% reviews from Rotten Tomatoes. It got positives from like the New York Times, uh, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, like all the big mags you'd want great reviews from. It got great reviews from. I don't know if many people have even seen that movie. It's a really good movie. I'm really proud of it. But the bottom line is I don't know how many people have seen that movie. So the biggest, biggest thing I ever got without question was Glow in the summer of 2016 we shot. So from the summer of 2016 to probably when I started, 1998, it's a fair start mark, I think. So that took 18 years Hmm. for me to get a high-profile show like Glow. You know, it may not happen for you right away, but I knew from the bottom of my heart that there was nothing else I wanted to do but cinematography. And there was a few times I almost quit. And my wife was like, nothing else makes you happy. Nothing mm. else makes you this happy. You're good at it. Keep trying. Keep fighting. So perseverance is a, if if you don't make it right away, if you don't hit the jackpot with Sundance or something else, you need perseverance. You need to understand and you need to have the intestinal and psychological fortitude to be able to weather slow times. I'd also I'd also add to your list of of uh, what you need in the business is a sense of humor. Sometimes you do yeah, because you're on a set that long. You have to. It has, you have to have a certain amount of levity because you know. You do. That's the thing about cinematography, too, guys. If you're a cinematographer, you know, photography is part of it. But you know, it's like photography is part of it. Management is part of it. Leadership is part of it. You know, I mean, like the the way you carry yourself on set as a cinematographer. Everyone notices it, and it plays a huge deal in terms of morale. You're kind of like a, a lighthouse in a way, for people on the crew. You know, when things go bad and you let it affect you and like you, people can see that it's making like it drastically affects yeah. mood and morale. Good point. So filmmaking, cinematography specifically is not just photography. Great deal of it is, but management, leadership, interpersonal skills, mm. ability to be able to manage, uh, be able to deliver to people other than yourself in terms of predatorially. I mean, these things are important and they're things you should work on. I can tell you right now, like interviewing skills is a huge part of you getting jobs. Huge part. If you don't interview well, I mean, that's a huge deal. If you get into an interview and people start, like, it's a, it's a really big deal. I can tell you half of the people will be like, when they ask me about a recommendation on someone, the reel is usually good. Now, most people have a pretty good reel in terms of shooters. Like I said, like you can get really high quality stuff with cameras now. But I guarantee, I, could, I can't tell you the amount of times People will ask me about a cinematographer or a production designer or an AD, and they're like, are they a good first AD? Are they a good whatever? 
And you'll say, yeah, 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 they know what they're doing. They're really good. The second question is always, are they good to work with? Mm. If you're not, like, these people don't want to spend three months with you. Yeah, good point. They don't want to spend three weeks with you. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's a so big deal. What's coming up for you in the future? Well, um, American, uh, American Princess premieres in June. Uh, that's what I've heard. And uh, that's that's what I'm hearing. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, I recently finished this uh, this show for Hulu. It was a uh, A24, one of A24's first television shows called Rami. It stars Rami Youssef, and it's about a Muslim American trying to find his way through his faith and through America. And uh, we just finished shooting that in New York City and Egypt, and that premieres in April on Hulu. And right now. I'm going to do Rami's HBO comedy special in uh, in early in 2019, and then I'm anxiously awaiting word on whether or not I'm going to do this uh, this Netflix project. So, um, fingers. I'm currently in uh, uh, the classic mindset of uh, post project where I think I'm never going to work again. <laughs> so that's where I am. <laughs> the life of a freelancer. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Well, listen, it was really great to meet you. Thanks for coming in, and we'll look for your upcoming projects. Thank you. It was awesome. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate it. See ya. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next time for another edition of Zeiss Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn more about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com. <laughs>